So like I said, we have a, we have a really wide-ranging um, panel, and we're going to be covering topics from um, intermedi intermediary liability to jurisdiction to copyright reform, criminal restrictions on speech, umbrella, sort of cyber law acts, you name it. And we're going to be doing all of that in 60 minutes. <laughs> um, it's going to be a fairly free-flowing panel, I hope. I've asked each of the panelists to give a five to ten minute talk to sort of give some initial remarks on, um, on their thought or thoughts on what the most important topics are and we'll, and we'll take it from there. Given that we're already short of time, I'm not going to introduce each of the panelists in the traditional way and I really apologize for that because they, they've all achieved so much and they are so eminent that they deserve a really full introduction but all of that is on the website. Um, I, and again, I, I really apologize for all of that. So dispensing with the introductions, thereby saving most of what I'd written down, we're going to kick off um, straight away with, with Mark. Now, Mark, you, you did a really good case recently which touches on some of these issues, right? Particularly on the issue of jurisdiction. It picks up from yesterday's topic of um, defamation laws and how they apply in an online context, as well as the issue of libel tourism, which we had a, a, a couple of people pitching for, for business yesterday. Um, now, perhaps you can, you can tell a bit about this latest case that you did, what the policy implications of it uh, are in your view and, and, and how it will reflect on future practice. Okay. Mark. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, many of you will know that crooks and brigands have been uh, jetting in to launder their reputations in London uh, for many years now. Uh, I see that this amuses uh, some of my colleagues from London, uh, but it is true and it's been a bit of a problem, particularly for foreign publications. Um, and this particular case, uh, a case called Karpoff against Browder, Hermitage and Firestone, um, was an interesting one. And I thought, I, you know, uh, we've talked at quite a high level and I thought I'd just tell you the story of the case because it is quite interesting and it tells you what the problem is that we're wrestling with in London and why uh, Lord Leicester's act has been become so important for us, particularly with its libel tourist uh, provision, uh, and why people have been complaining about this for so long. Um, Karpov uh, was uh, a Russian police officer earning the equivalent of six and a half thousand US dollars per annum. Uh, under Russian law, he's not allowed to have any other source of income. So, uh, he uh, decides with a gang uh, to partake, uh, so it is alleged, in a, a, a fraud. Uh, I don't think that saves me, actually, uh, <laughs> whoever was tittering me. But uh, to, to in engage in a fraud. Um, uh, and the way in which uh, that works is that uh, in Russia at the moment, there's a lot of targeting of um, large taxpayers and uh, Mr. Browder was uh, an Anglo-American guy, a hedge fund, who went to the US and decided that he was going to, uh, sorry, go, went to Russia. And he realized that um, the assets in Russia were under, undervalued. There was political risk uh, that had been factored in. And that was at about 40% as a discount on the price. He thought that actually the proper discount was about 20%. And after he'd been out into the marketplace and agreed with that, uh, indeed that was, the, that was the, the rate that seemed to apply and it, he managed to make quite a lot of money uprating Russian assets. Um, he had a hedge fund backed by HSBC called uh, Hermitage Capital and uh, he employed local lawyers, an American lawyer working in Moscow called Jamie Firestone. And they were doing very well. They paid one year 230 uh, million US dollars in tax to the Russian authorities. So as you can imagine, he was a fairly rich man. Um, the, in Russia, it's a bit like uh, a bearer share corporation. The person who owns the shares or has possession of the uh, seals of the company is effectively the owner. So. Uh, the financial police, which included Karpov, uh, raided the offices of Hermitage and also their lawyers, firm, uh, Firestone, and seized the relevant documents. Uh, they then um, 
the, the criminal gang who were associated uh, with Karpov started a, uh, a legal suit in the Russian Far East um, where a nominal plaintiff claimed that uh, uh, Hermitage actually owed 230 million US dollars. Funny that that number keeps cropping up. Uh, they took that, they, they took a default judgment on that. Hermitage didn't defend it. And so they then went to the Russian tax authorities and said, oh, by the way, we forgot when we filed our tax return and paid you the $230 million that uh, we had this judgment against us for $230 million. Could we have the $230 million back? And uh, lo and behold, the Russian tax authorities repaid that money within 24 hours. Um, it was then disseminated and, and so on and so forth. That... Um, whole story was unpicked by a very brave Russian lawyer called Sergei Magnitsky. Uh, Sergei was uh, deeply unpopular for having fingered the various people, uh, some of whom go into the Kremlin, uh, in uh, unpicking that particular story. He was illegally arrested, uh, detained, tortured whilst under arrest, and ultimately killed uh, whilst in illegal custody. Um, the reaction was that the Russian president, Mez Medvedev then, uh, his human rights commission said that there were uh, problems with the way in which this had been dealt with and named Karpov amongst others, uh, and he tried to sue them for libel in Russia, first criminally, then civilly, and failed both times. Um, they then, uh, Browder, uh, not being able to get... Uh, justice in Russia, decided to put up uh, a series of uh, YouTube videos, which is where we get to the internet, called Russian Untouchables. And you can Google those up on uh, YouTube if you wish to. They're still there. Uh, there's some in Russian, uh, four, four editions, uh, four in Russian and four in English. Uh, they are basically the same. Um, the question then came with Karpov, um, this man, who you'll recall from the beginning of the story, uh, was uh, earning six and a half thousand pounds, uh, sorry, six and a half thousand dollars a year, uh, managed to come to London to retain a City of London law firm, Oldswang, uh, five lawyers in that firm, uh, a leading counsel, top uh, London QC, Andrew Caldercott, uh, and a junior, and uh, a former editor of the News of the World, Phil Hall, uh, as his PR man. Um, they must have been very cheap. Um, <laughs> or he had some money, which he couldn't explain. Uh, neither of us could understand that. Anyway, uh, we decided to make an application to strike the claim out uh, on the grounds that he did not have a substantial reputation in the jurisdiction, that, that no, and no substantial tort had taken place within the jurisdiction. And... Uh, in truth, I didn't expect to win this at first instance. I was hoping for a decent, decent outing before uh, Lord Dyson, but uh, I was deprived and we won uh, at first instance. And, it was, and they're not going to appeal. It's a very good decision, well worth reading. Um, and uh, it really goes back to uh, define whether uh, this issue around whether London is an appropriate jurisdiction or it is the appropriate jurisdiction. And for the first time, uh, it looks like uh, the uh, judges are beginning to look at uh, this issue of libel tourism, uh, which has been so uh, easily highlighted and well highlighted by Lord Lester, uh, and also to pick up the particular problem that we have. And, and this is kind of a, a question about that. And there are other cases which you know, are the foundation for these kind of libel tourism cases, which I think might not come back and be dealt with in the same way. Now, that's what I was going to say about that particular case, and I'm happy to answer questions about it later. Um, but one of the things I think is quite interesting about that is that, you know, the British courts decided they weren't prepared to deal with YouTube videos which are held on servers based in America. Um, and that's quite interesting because of, in and of itself, even if they had got a judgment, uh, they wouldn't have been able to enforce it in America, uh, which is also quite interesting because President Obama uh, introduced the Speech Act, 
which says that anything that uh, any foreign judgment, whether Hong Kong, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, wherever, that uh, is not uh, uh, congruent and hasn't been obtained in, uh, to the same standards as US justice uh, and the guarantees of free speech will not be enfor uh, enforced uh, in the United States. So it, it looked like these videos were never coming down anyway. Yeah, and that raises the whole position of the, um, you know, the question of the position of intermediaries, right? Well, yeah. Um, and, and of course, there's a big difference. In America, intermediaries would get uh, protection under uh, Section 230, uh, whereas I think in other countries, they're not getting that uh, yeah. same, yeah. same protection. Yeah. Have, I, have I got time just to pick up on something, a theme that came out of Lord Dyson's? No, you, you, you have, and then I'm going to make an awkward segue back into intermediaries. To okay, bring in all right. okay, well, th I, did, I, did, I did just want to pick something up, uh, which was a theme that came out of Lord Dyson's uh, 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 speech, which was uh, about um, the issue of scandalizing the courts. Now, scandalizing the courts we don't have as a problem, but uh, because we abolished the whole concept uh, some time ago, partly because our judiciary have taken uh, a fairly robust view. Um, uh, the Daily Mail published uh, pictures of uh, a series of law lords in their full bottom wigs uh, upside down in the newspaper marked uh, uh, oh, under the headline, Old Fools. Um, uh, which I think was probably a criticism of their judgment um, uh, as opposed to a descriptor. And in, in any event, uh, the uh, judges, uh, one of them said to me, well, I am fairly elderly and uh, some people might regard me as foolish, although I don't. Um, but uh, that, I think, indicated the right to free speech. But of course, there have been problems. And, uh, you know, for example, in Mauritius at the moment, there's a case about to come to the Privy Council in February um, where uh, Samedi Plou, the French language Sunday paper, um, interviewed a, a local lawyer who very trenchantly criticized uh, the local chief justice. Um, and uh, the reporter accurately reported what was said um, and the editor has been sentenced to a period of, of jail. Of course, the lawyer got away scot-free, um, and uh, the uh, journalist also didn't get it. It was the editor who, who actually got it in that case. And we've had similar problems uh, in Malaysia, where some of you are old enough, I know Imtiaz is, to remember Murray Hebert, uh, who's, uh, who, who it was said in the Far East Economic Review, uh, that uh, his son had been, uh, the judge's son had been uh, cheating on the school debating team, and that was held to be scandalizing the court and the member of the judiciary, and he was sentenced to six months in a Kuala Lumpur jail. Um, and th there's, a, there's, a, there's another more recent cases in, 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 in uh, Malaysia as well. Uh, but there are also problems in Fiji, Botswana, Tobago, Singapore. This is not a local problem. And I think you know, one of the questions is, um, how are the judiciary going to become robust enough to be able to withstand uh, public scrutiny uh, of the sort that Bentham talked about, public criticism in a proper uh, way, I'm not, I'm not talking about ad hominem attacks, uh, and how are we going to um, also uh, avoid the sort of uh, political criticisms and interference that might otherwise come uh, in some of the countries. But it does seem to me that this uh, criminalizing of speech through the old offense of scandalizing the court uh, has had its time, and perhaps it's time to, to challenge it. Uh, you know, we are in a position uh, which, uh, in the UK, for the first time, we've got a Lord Chancellor um, who is not a lawyer. Um, uh, some of us might think that that was a suboptimal position. Um, he is a politician, uh, non-lawyer, supposedly to defend the rights and interests of the judiciary. Um, that, I think, is probably a very difficult position for him and the judiciary. Uh, and in those circumstances, I think, you know, there needs to be uh, perhaps a greater dialogue, perhaps a greater openness. Uh, in this situation, and I suspect 
the same is true of many of the countries uh, sitting in this room. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, and, and I think we're going to be coming down back to that. Um, I actually thought later today, but it might be tomorrow. Well, no, later today, in fact, we've got um, Alan Shadrick's lawyer here, um, Ravi, who took the um, contempt of court case there. Um, and I think your Privy Council case doesn't come a moment too soon. Actually, it's too late for that. Um, but it doesn't come a moment too soon for future cases, which I know are lining up. Now, for that awkward segue into intermediate reliability, so I'd like to bring in Marcelo at this point, who has done a lot of work on this, has uh, three postgraduate degrees from Oxford, Ottawa, and um, Rio de Janeiro Pontifical University, uh, where I was last Monday, and very nice. Um, but you, you strongly believe that there needs to be a moral obligation on intermediaries, right, to, um, to act and that that yep. uh, might resolve issues. So um, I, I want to focus on this question on the, on the liability of uh, internet intermediaries. And uh, actually the, the title of my talk is, uh, was intended to be the moral responsibility of internet intermediaries. So it's a, it's a very timely, uh, very important question which I address with some trepidation here uh, given the number of specialists in the audience uh, and, I, I, and, I, and I do so as a young scholar. So uh, I hope you'll pardon. Uh, any uh, mistake. So I want to focus on, on this question, which is the question concerning the normative role of non-state actors, or more specifically, a particular class of these actors, which are internet intermediaries, companies like Google and Facebook through the services they provide. The point I want to make in this regard is the following. I want to argue that there are reasons of, at the same time, utilitarian and de deontological moral nature for approaching intermediaries from a normative normative perspective as actors who make the law. An implication of this argument in turn is that we need to take an internal point of view as we approach their activities. In other words, we need to understand intermediaries as part of a system of reasons towards which they, like many others, have responsibilities. I have just said that there are others who have responsibilities. Who are these others? We have been speaking of them these days, the press and even bloggers who have a responsible communication defense, to use the more encompassing Canadian uh, name available to them. A defense which is as much a, a defense as it is a duty of communicating, communicating responsibly. We, the good reporters, the common folks who perform the difficult task of seeking to ascertain the truth, we do not have a duty of always getting it right. We sometimes get it wrong and nonetheless may get away with it but we all need to be responsible actors of the communicative process. We need to apply reasonable efforts to get to the truth on whose knowledge the public interest lies. When truth is violated, reputation is certainly violated as well, but something more is violated with it, which is the normative order as a whole. As John Klippinger reminds us in his formidable account of one, the future of individual identity, the signaling and recognition of the attributes that make up our identity matter for reasons that transcend uh, our individual, uh, individual selves. Our identities form a social structure, a social layer on which we rely to navigate life in society. We resort to institutional mechanisms, for instance courts, to protect the way the signaling of our attributes is carried out not only because we need to remedy individual injustices, but because justice, more broadly, depends on a truthful representation of ourselves. The governance of our identity matters normatively, and we all thus have uh, responsibilities towards a governance system that is as open to social scrutiny as it can be. This responsibility does is a responsibility of normative nature. It relates to our social norms and to our law as an institutionalization of the normative order. The idea of responsibility towards the development of a, a normative order in time is one that we find in the work of legal and political scholars such uh, as Neil McCormick, Ronald Workin, Iris, Iris Marion Young, amongst others who focus on the idea of a moral responsibility uh, towards uh, the normative order, to, towards the development of normativity itself. We can, there is to say, uh, demand responsibility from each other towards moral, political, normative deliberation because a just society is one in which none of its actors remain neutral towards structural forms of injustice reflected in the normative order. 
including injustice regarding the representation of something as deeply important as who we are. This, in other words, means that the locus of justice, which certainly involves the state, nonetheless goes beyond the state. So if we demand such kind of normative responsibility from journalists, bloggers, uh, tweeters, should we demand less from those who design and manage the very avenues of the information environment? Do they profit less from their economic enterprises than newspapers who just now seek to reinvent business models that have been completely disrupted by their enterprises? Do they not already, as other companies, count on limited liability benefits, themselves controversial at their middle age origins, uh, as a means for incentivizing and protecting the organization of their economic activities? Is it that the only duty of intermediaries should be to deliver the identity of those who are caught red-handed in the practice of defamation, regardless of how negligent, even malicious, intermediaries have, uh, may have been in keeping online content that they know they have been told to be defamatory online? You have heard from my colleagues how the law has revolved uh, with regard to intermediary liability in the US, the UK, Canada, and Hong Kong, and its Southeast Asian neighbors. Uh, there are two small points uh, that I want to make briefly here in connection with my main point. The first is that the question concerning the liability of intermediaries has, follow, has followed a pendular trajectory. Uh, yet we have often focused at the pendulum uh, only at the different extremities of this movement. In other words, approaches have adopted a relatively uh, a binary strategy in which, in which internet intermediaries have either been deemed to be immune or to be responsible for a certain result. Yet I would like to argue that as a cor corollary of the normative <laughs> responsibility of intermediaries, liability should perhaps not accrue from the result, but from the normative attitude they adopt. The concern with chilling effects is certainly a justified concern. Uh, and in the US, we know that for virtually everything not involving the protection of intellectual property, which is governed by the DMCA, the pendulum has waved towards freedom of expression. Uh, from, the origin, from the original position in the Kubi case, uh, where liability was based on actual knowledge of the allegedly defamatory statement, law has moved towards an, an immunity system uh, introduced by the Communications Decency Act. Uh, in Europe, in turn, uh, we have the e-commerce directive that has established a system according to which a host must act to expeditiously, expeditiously take content down upon acquiring uh, actual knowledge. Uh, both the European Court of Justice jurisprudence in the eBay versus L'Oreal case and the UK uh, e-commerce regulation have it that a notification is generally a fact which courts need to take into account in deciding about liability. Uh, in the UK, uh, the position uh, has evolved uh, uh, since the uh, D Defamation Act uh, 1996. Until more recently, uh, there, there have been a number of cases that I, I need to uh, cut short uh, uh, for the sake of brevity here. Uh, but uh, uh, ultimately, uh, things are turned to the Tummies case, which was decided this year uh, uh, by the Court of Appeal, uh, reversing uh, Mr. Justice uh, Edie's Edith, decision. Uh, in endorsing the position of the case at uh, Davison versus Habib, which held that following notification, uh, an intermediary would be unable to establish that it was ignorant of the existence of the defamatory material. Uh, in Metropolitan, Mr. Justice Eady took it to be relevant that efforts were being made to take the defamatory content down. Uh, in Hong Kong, the Court of Final Appeal in Oriental Press versus FeverWorks, a case mentioned by, by my colleague uh, uh, Rick yesterday, uh, noted that a platform provider must, genu uh, must, must genuinely recognize and take all reasonable steps to protect the rights and reputations of persons. And while the court recognized the importance of not impairing economic activity via unduly strict standards, it also affirmed the common law defense of innocent dissemination would only be available if it was established that the defendant, upon obtaining, obtaining knowledge of the content, promptly took all the reasonable steps to remove the offending content from, from circulation as soon as reasonably practical. In all these cases, we see the pendulum erring too much towards the protection of reputation uh, and prompting the possibility of chilling effects arising as a result. This is so since an online service provider 
who may indeed uh, be aware of the content, but which does not believe the content to be offensive, will nonetheless refrain from reasoning about the nature of the content and will simply take it down. This also violates that normative responsibility we were speaking at the beginning, the responsibility towards the development of a normative order that is faithful to the representation of our personal attributes. It prompts thus a social concern with the pursuit of public interest in the truth that is not so different, after all, from that which motivates the responsible communication defense. Perhaps the step that, uh, that this normative responsibility uh, entails uh, are not steps simply geared towards taking down of content uh, of whose existence one is aware. Perhaps they involve a reasonable efforts, obligation of taking objective steps similar to those adopted in the factors that have been recently abolished in the UK, as they have been also recently adopted in, in Grant versus Tor Toronto Star uh, and other cases, uh, uh, the, the Reynolds uh, factors. Perhaps our focus, focus sh should not be in seeking to interpret whether an online service provider was right or wrong in the resulting act, right or wrong in its, in, in its interpretation of the normative order in the resulting act of taking down. Perhaps our focus should be on whether an online service provider has, according to a number of factors, pursued an interpretation of the normative order that, that was as good as it could reasonably be. So what I'm advocating here is a best efforts <laughs> obligation, analogous to the, the best efforts <laughs> obligation that we have uh, for all those others who communicate responsibly. So if Twitchers, if the blogosphere, if journalists have this defense, right? Why shouldn't, we, and, uh, and also the duty of communicating responsibly, why shouldn't mm -hmm. uh, internet intermediaries have the same uh, defense, but also the same duty of uh, uh, communicating uh, responsibly? Uh, and the final point that I want to make here, uh, to, uh, to cut it short, uh, 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 ensuring from the idea of a moral responsibility of internet intermediaries, uh, is the following. Uh, regulatory theory today speaks of decentralized regulation. We talk of legal pluralism. In the internet literature uh, uh, and institutional uh, governance of the internet, there is a growing call for a principle of multi-stakeholderism that is no different from what we have been alluding to uh, uh, as a responsibility uh, which is shared by everyone towards uh, the development of the normative order, towards the development of law. Uh, but this is championed by internet inter intermediaries themselves. Inter intermediaries want to have a say as if they uh, did not already strongly have uh, in the making of laws and policies in the information age, uh, transcending the notion of state-based and in particular UN-based law. Uh, it, it is perhaps time uh, to call on them to display the same normative interest that they have towards institutional developments uh, that affect the internet. Uh, that, uh, that affect their own interests, that they have this normative interest also towards realms of the normative order that affects the interests of others and of our lives as a whole. Uh, it is an approach of integrity, or as the late Dworkin uh, would perhaps put it, of law uh, as integrity. So the same interest that, they, that internet intermediaries display in the evolution of law, in the evolution of the normative order concerning the internet, right? Why do, don't they display the same interest of, of performing uh, a, a, a role, a, a normative role, uh, with regard to issues that come on a daily basis uh, for their appreciation? Is it that they only want to contribute to the development of the normative order when their own interests are at stake? Right? W and what about when a reputation, when a, uh, what about when uh, uh, the interests of, of society in having our uh, 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 personal attributes accurately represented uh, are at stake. Don't don't they all don't should they uh, shouldn't they also have an interest uh, 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 on these issues and uh, uh, and a responsibility of acting uh, normatively uh, normatively in, in this regard. Uh, so that's uh, thank my thank thank you very much. Yeah. That 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 raises some really interesting and controversial points. Um, I also wonder uh, you, you sort of alert. Uh, alluded to a normative responsibility almost to keep things up as well yep. on intermediary. Yep. Exactly, so it, it exactly. sort of it cuts both ways. <laughs> exactly. So uh, um, the, the no, no, you don't have to go into that now. 
I'm, 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 about, to do, I'm about to do another awkward segue. <laughs> <laughs> so short of time. I have, I just, to come later but I wanted to questions. mark that um, for four, four questions for the panel. I also wanted to mark that I think Google has 3,000 cases pending uh, in Brazil alone on uh, takedown requests. Yes. Um, and Brazil is its most that. sort of busiest yes. jurisdiction on that, <laughs> um, which, is, you know, which is an interesting point. Um, but if you want a career in media law, Brazil is clearly the destination. <laughs> yeah, well, learn Portuguese <laughs> first. Uh, it's kind of a... But it's a nice country. Um, anyway, to leave intermediary liability there, I wanted to move on um, to, to what's going on here, in fact, in, um, um, in this country, in Hong Kong. Um, and I wanted to come to Charles. Um, now, Charles, you've been, you've been dealing with a whole range of issues. Um, just looking at your bio, you do, you know, you, yeah, you, 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 your work sort of spans. Um, yeah. Just an IT guy. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Anyway, you, you were going to talk about the recent copyright consultation, and you were also going to flag up some concerns you have about the use of personal data on right. public devices. Right. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, uh, first of all, if I look a bit intimidated in front of all these lawyers and professors and judges, uh, uh, because I'm really just an IT guy, and, uh, I and I look at two Blackberries in, uh, uh, next to me, and I have an iPhone and Android. So... Uh, uh, the two cases that I want to very quickly talk about, actually the first one, actually had a <laughs> bit of, uh, to do with what uh, Michelle just talked about, uh, uh, the situation of uh, intermediaries in Hong Kong, in particular the copyright ordinance uh, amendments that we are <laughs> undergoing right now, because uh, Hong Kong, uh, compared to many other jurisdictions, we are actually quite behind in the, uh, instituting the kind of uh, request, uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, legal <laughs> Uh, uh, structure uh, in the law to uh, allow uh, copyright owners to ask for the co the uh, internet to ask the uh, to ask the uh, internet companies to take down and remove content. Uh, right now, uh, they have to go to the court in order to do it, uh, rather than having a uh, uh, notice and take down or notice and notice sort of procedures like in many other countries. So uh, actually we've been uh, trying to do this, um, the government has been trying to do this amendment for a long time, uh, but uh, it has been stored last year in our legislature, uh, mainly because uh, of a lot of uh, internet users coming up, coming out and saying that, hey, uh, they feel that uh, uh, any, any, any amendment without an exemption for what they're doing with parity uh, would be uh, would be dangerous. So uh, I, I think actually they, they don't quite understand what the law is about. But uh, in any event, they raise a very good question. Uh, the fact that they uh, they think that uh, there needs to be an exemption for parody uh, work uh, der on der or derivative work uh, that they do on the internet. In Hong Kong, as in probably in many other countries, uh, a lot of users they do a lot of these. Uh, 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 changing, uh, altering uh, uh, videos or, or, or songs or, or uh, movie posters and so on in order to make a point, particularly uh, against political figures. So uh, anyway, t this year, right now, actually the government is undergoing a consultation uh, that actually the government has, to its credit, uh, proposed uh, s uh, exemption for both, uh, uh, one of the options is an exemption for both uh, civil and criminal liability for uh, parity on the internet. Now, of course, uh, actually, I wouldn't go into the details, but uh, this this is uh, actually one of the developments that we are uh, having in Hong Kong right now, uh, in some ways uh, having to do with these internet intermediaries, because from the intermediary company's point of view, what they want is the safe harbor. <laughs> That uh, many other countries, many other, many other uh, these internet companies in other countries uh, enjoy, which uh, actually they don't at the moment in Hong Kong. But uh, I really want to what I really want to go into is the second uh, case about uh, actually Professor Ying Chen uh, asked a question related to this to Lord Dyson a, a while ago, uh, and I'll I'll, I'll I'll tell you a bit more of the detail of this particular case. Uh, it has to do with, uh, I think, uh, a growing trend of a, a conflict of the internet with uh, privacy laws. Uh, uh, and uh, in this particular case, there's one company in Hong Kong that uh, uh, created an app uh, that is co that's called Do No Evil. And uh, this particular app 
uh, despite its name, uh, is actually all it's doing is that it collected uh, from a particular uh, database company in Hong Kong that has been collecting uh, court litigation information for many years. Uh, basically, they just go to the court and record down some guide to all the magistrate, to all the up to, to the higher level of courts, and they just go and write down all these cases, who's suing who, uh, on what particular date. Uh, that's all. Uh, because the problem is, in Hong Kong, uh, many of these cases, the result of these cases, the decisions of these cases, are not necessarily put on the web. Uh, and uh, particularly true for the lower, ca lower courts. So the idea of this particular app is that, okay, I have some guy, you know, get all these information from this database company, this app companies, and uh, they also get some of these information, public information about uh, bankruptcy records and so on, and put it all into an app. And then uh, if I want to know about uh, Professor Chen, okay, I want to know whether she's been sued or she's been uh, bankrupt before, I would be able to enter her name and then get <laughs> all this information. Uh, it, it doesn't include the information about the decision of these uh, judgments or, or judgments of these uh, cases, but it only indicates whether a person of that particular name has been sued or not. Uh, so the uh, Privacy Commissioner came out and basically banned this app and say that it is uh, in, in ba uh, first of all, I think a couple of the reasons that he gave, the first one is that it's too easy. Uh, uh, it's too easy uh, for anybody to be able to get these information. It infringes on the privacy of the individuals. Uh, of course, our response from the industry is that, well, uh, I, we don't know where in the law uh, said that you have to go through a lawyer in order to see this, in, in order to, to look at this information. Because be, uh, before this case, before this app, or after the decision uh, by the privacy commissioner to take down this app, uh, actually, you can still go to a lawyer's firm, uh, to, to a legal firm, to a, law, to, to a lawyer and say that I want to check on Professor Chen and then, she'll get, and then you'll get the same information. The only difference is that you have to pay a lot more money uh, in the process, maybe a several thousand Hong Kong dollars in order to check on one person rather than you know, maybe $20 or whatever or $10 on, on your app. Uh, now, that's, that's, that's uh, the first explanation. The second reason that the privacy commissioner gave was that uh, it infringes on uh, the data pr protection principle number three in Hong Kong. In particular, saying that uh, this particular app, in this case, uh, the, 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 it, it, the, the use of the data is different from the original intent of that the data is either collected or, 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 or used or, or, ex or, or given. So uh, the, the privacy commissioner basically is saying that, okay, uh, the, uh, the court posting all this information on his front door or whatever on his Buddhist board every morning is for the guy to show up on time. And that's the only purpose. So uh, now that you, you, are, you are aggregating and redistributing all this information, uh, you are not using these data according to its original intention. Uh, uh, that is a violation of the data protection principle number three. Uh, of course, from our point of view, all this information has been posted in such ways, you know, even including company registry information, bankruptcy uh, registration, marriage registry re uh, information for many, many years before we even had any privacy protection ordinance in Hong Kong, which was since 1997 or eight. Uh, so uh, in, in our minds, these uh, individual departments, including court probably only at that time because in because they have to uh, uh, they have to follow the law when the law came into effect. So they say, okay, we just decide what is the reason for posting this information, which they never thought about that case before. But now in 1998, uh, they probably say, okay, it's for people to show up on time, and they defined it very narrowly. And uh, the the problem is, of course, uh, these days uh, we have a different movement in governments that is called open data, which is for the government to provide data in machine-readable formats so that people can write, uh, use technology to analyze and to uh, write apps and so on. And this is totally in counter of this particular movement that uh, this decision uh, is, is, is about. So uh, uh, in the end, I think one of the solution to, to solve this uh, problem is that uh, we need to have an exemption for personal data in the public domain. 
in which uh, my understanding, and we have, you have so many lawyers and professors here, you can tell me whether it's true. I was told that it is already uh, 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 in the law in many other countries, in some of the other countries, including Singapore and New Zealand and so on. Uh, but uh, in our uh, consultation for the revision of our privacy ordinance a couple of years ago, this government decided not uh, to take a look into this particular matter. So in, so in short, there's no exemption for personal data in the public domain. So they took a very narrow view of uh, as if they are talking about other forms of personal data that uh, t that your telephone companies collect from you and so on, and uh, and say that you can only use it in the same way that these data are being published or collected and so on. So, uh, uh, but in but in reality, in this day and age, with uh, all these information that is being collected, for example, I hear from uh, Lord Dyson that uh, you know. You might even, in some in some time to come, uh, we we have a live broadcast of court proceedings uh, uh, happening soon. If that happens, uh, all this information will be kept, will be on the internet, will be stored somewhere. How do you control uh, its use according to such narrow definition? It's pe simply in not feasible anymore. In fact, this particular decision uh, would probably also mean that we cannot go to a newspaper's archive to, uh, to check whether or not someone has been sued and reported by the, uh, a particular newspaper <laughs> since 20 or 30 years ago. And we just want to check whether or not somebody of that name uh, have, been, uh, have, been, uh, uh, in, have been sued. So uh, this is, I think, the kind of uh, uh, conflict that we are continuing to see uh, because of technology, because of people using technology, because of people using the innovation and uh, innovative uh, minds and uh, creativity to create new applications and so on with the uh, vastly mo bigger and bigger amount of, uh, t uh, of storage of data that is available and mu so easily accessible by so many people and uh, coming into uh, 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 confrontation with uh, the uh, growing uh, concern which is, uh, I actually think that that's, that's a good thing, but on, on in one way, the growing concern uh, uh, on our own privacy. So we are seeing probably more and more of these conflicts. And so this is an interesting case, and I just want to you know uh, bring to your attention. Thank you. That is a really interesting case, and it's a really interesting issue, which sort of reminds me of an issue from, from Indonesia, Bambang. Is, isn't it, was it one of the Suharto family who had been convicted of accessory to murder about 10, 15 years ago. Yes. That was then dragged up in a newspaper report, and the newspaper was done for it, for privacy, because he was deemed to have served his sentence, and sort of, you know, we should all now forget about this whole accessory yeah. to murder thing, okay? That was in the past, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, any, anyway, that's not what you came here to talk no. about. <laughs> <laughs> I was just reminded about yeah. it. Um, you, you wanted to m move on to um, a provo proposed revision of mm -hmm. internet legislation yeah. in, in Indonesia. Yeah. Um, please, go ahead. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Peter. I'm, I'm doing away with awkward segues yeah. now. <laughs> thank you, Peter. When I heard uh, Marcelo talk a few words about responsibility, it r really raised my hackles. <laughs> you know, because in the old time, in the under Suharto time, the word responsibility is always being used to put journalists in jail, any people who's uh, exercising their free t speech in jail. Because they said, you are not being responsible, <laughs> so we should put you in jail. So you can be more responsible. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I feel a bit, uh, I'm comfortable with this word responsible, actually. <laughs> and, uh, and the other reason is because, can you, uh, uh, I also think that the younger generation has different concept about uh, free speech and also about uh, privacy. Because, you know, uh, in Indonesia now we have 29 million uh, tweeters and about 64 million Facebookers. And if you read what they tweet or what they or on their, well, uh, anything. You, today I ate this. No privacy at all. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, today I'm in, my, in the loo and reading this novel. You know, so it's totally different. And can you imagine, in the same time, we have a law, an internet law, that basically says if you defame someone but in internet, you can go to jail for six years. 
and a, a fine of up to a hundred thousand dollars. And can you imagine there are 29 million tweeters and 64 million Facebookers, mostly young, young people, and we have only jail for a capacity of 85,000, <laughs> and it's already overcrowded by 135,000 uh, people. Can you imagine if you, you just put 1,000 of these uh, tweeters and Facebookers, because you know, 90% of the time they defame someone in these tweets. <laughs> Yeah. President stupid, you know, this minister is uh, so dumb, you know, or something like that. So how do you do that? You can't put uh, 100 million people in a jail with only capacity for 85,000, and especially all these young people, and who is going to feed them? <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> so, and, but I have to admit that this law, which is uh, created in 2008, uh, at that time, I was a member of the press council. I feel that we were caught sleeping on guard. And the reason is because this uh, internet law was already, they started to formulate this uh, law in 2003, you know, almost five years. And, and then one day, the minister of information, which is uh, a friend of mine when uh, we were both studying in Boston, uh, you know, he's, he said, you know, uh, why don't the press council look at this draft and see whether you have any, you know, uh, you know, any problem with it. And I look at it and it's basically, and then the chair asked me to read through it. And then I look at it, this is about maybe 50 something article. It's, on, it's only dealt with e-commerce. So then I, ha I made a recommendation, you know, the press council uh, have no problem with this because it's nothing to do with uh, with the freedom of the press, which is our job to to, to protect. So then we say, I, I, we all thought it was a safe uh, bill, so it was sent by the government to the to the uh, to the parliament, and we didn't. This is the mistake we did. We didn't really observe it. What really happened in 2008? And there was this guy who sort of create a, a website with the name of our president. And then, uh, and it, you know, it's actually a pornographic site. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and of course, there was a, an uproar, and then the president was uh, not very happy about it and asked the police to do something about it. And the police said, we don't have internet law. We cannot do anything legally to do something about it. So then, obviously, there are some people in the, in the parliament who thought, oh, we should do something about it while, you know, we're doing. So they edit these three articles without us aware of it. And then suddenly when it was becoming a law, then, and then suddenly we found out, oh my God, you can go to jail for or up to six years and fine of 100,000 if you defame someone through the internet. And this is crazy because the old law, we, you know, we are still using our penal law, is uh, uh, the colonial law, is the, the, the punishment for criminal defamation is nine months. And the problem with six years is because in our uh, system, if you are charged with, uh, with uh, infringement of a law that carry a maximum uh, sentence of more than five years, the police has a very great, probably will put you in detainment because it's, it's, they feel it's their right. Because uh, so, so it's a very dangerous law, and uh, it happened. Then, luckily, just before the election of a president, a, a woman who complained about the service she got from a private uh, hospital sent an email to maybe ten of her friends about how bad the treatment of this uh, hospital, and then it was so horrible that those ten uh, uh, friends decided to send it to their friends, and then it went viral, because this is supposed to be an expensive and, you know, uh, hospital, private hotel owned by a very nasty uh, conglomerate. And lo and behold, and then suddenly this law was being used, and this woman was put in jail. Uh, but because the case is so, you know, it's so clearly, uh, horribly unjustified, then uh, there was a big noise in the internet world, in the Twitters, in the Facebook, 
and then the media also, uh, you know, uh, carried the story through, and it was almost a campaign. So then, when the story went viral, all the presidential campaign thought it was important that they went to visit this woman and promised her to be, you know, free. So in the end, uh, she she was freed. But but of course, law is a law. <laughs> Later on, they found her guilty, not only in uh, uh, criminal defamation but civilian defamation, and then she has to pay a fine of, you know, hundred thousand of dollars. And she was just a middle class woman. And then, uh, but this is a good thing about free speech is, and it create problem in the in the society. So it went viral again. And somebody decided, let's give a small token of money, coin money, to pay for her for her punishment. So people were everywhere were giving coins, all over Indonesia. From the, and this is from the western part to the eastern part. And Indonesia is a big size. If you put European country, you probably will put like uh, 11, 11, you know, countries. It's, it's, the size is between London to Moscow, I think. So it's quite big, and people and there are more money than her punishment. So then we decided to do something about it. We went to the Constitutional Court, but I think we were too ambitious. We thought this, this is a good chance to get rid of criminal defamation. Unfortunately, the Constitutional Court think there is still a ground for criminal defamation. So we lost the case. And, uh, but then uh, the good thing now is that Indonesia next week in Bali on the 24th will host the UNESCO uh, meeting on internet. And obviously our government <laughs> feel quite embarrassed if, you know, they, uh, uh, they, they are talking about internet and, uh, and then we have this horrible law. So yesterday uh, we, uh, there is a meeting with, with the the governments and that's why I couldn't come here yesterday but there is some good news because the government then decided they are going to revise the law and they said they already in fact officially sent it to the parliament and the parliament already put it on on their agenda next year that they will revise the law but unfortunately to me at least when I saw their proposed change is only that the punishment will be maximum a year, which to me it's still a problem. Still a year too long. So yeah, a year too long. And I, I mean, even if you put, you know, 1% of this 29 million uh, Twitter user or 64 million euro, we don't have the jail anyway. And we cannot feed them, you know, the government budget. So then uh, my propose is just to get rid of these three articles because anyway, the criminal definition is still there in, in our uh, penal code. So, you know, for those who still like to have criminal defamation, they will not lose anything <laughs> from, from this. And anyway, how can you be more cruel to your own people than the colonial law? <laughs> that doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> you know, so, so then I, I said, oh, okay, so we are still fighting about it. And, uh, but, my, my, but also, I want to share a little bit about how we debated yesterday about this. I, I'm a bit controversial on this uh, because to me, I truly believe in this little kid song that the Western kid always sing. You know, the mother, the parent always teach the, their kid in order to be able to defend themselves against bullying by singing this song. Stick and bone can hurt my bone, but word alone will never hurt me. And to me, this is true. Can anyone hurt me with their word if I don't allow them? And I truly believe nobody can hurt me with their word unless I allow them. But the problem is the more I love a person, the more I allow them to hurt me with their word, right? But people that I don't know can say anything about me, I don't feel anything. But if my wife say I'm bad, that's really hurt me. Then you yeah. listen. <laughs> But uh, so so, but but the, my main point is that hurt by word is actually the control is in us, not in other people who uttered the word. And why is this guy has to go to jail? 
if it is yourself who allow him to hurt you. So to me, criminal uh, defamation is inhuman. And anyway, the basic research from Stanford told you that in by statistic, if you meet with someone and within 10 minutes after that person talk to you, he or she already told you at least between two to three lies. Because we all lies. <laughs> you know? It's part of our human nature. And the more creative you are, the more possibly you lies more. <laughs> it's nothing to do with intelligence, but it's to do with your creativity. And we are actually going into a more creative words. <laughs> so meaning, meaning people are allowed to lie. It's you you have to decide whether this guy is telling you the truth or lie. And you have uh, well equipped. You know you can just go your Blackberry or iPhone, Google it. Is he telling the truth or lies? <laughs> so you are prepared to do that. Yeah. So to me, I'm still my campaign is get rid of this uh, criminal defamation. Because in my uh, personal experience in the press council for six years, those people who complain the most that their reputations are being blemished, actually people who had very bad reputations. <laughs> You know, Pe people who have good reputation usually all they ask is, "I had my say." Then let's let's say it's between me and you. People we believe who, and people who have good reputation, we always win in the court of public opinion. And we have a very good example. We have now a very very uh, popular governor, who's probably will become our president next year. Um, of course, all the other candidates, and, and especially this candidate who without him would be leading the poll, is trying very hard to blemish him. But what happened? The more they throw dirt at him, the more popular he is. <laughs> you know, because people, when, when two people, one highly reputable and the other one is very low repute, throw mud at each other, the mud, this lower uh, repute people throw, go back to him twice the speed of sound. <laughs> you know? So uh, I think this, this reputation, you have to be careful. I mean, uh, uh, but the problem is, these people with bad reputation usually have a lot of money and can hire the best lawyer, the most expensive lawyer. <laughs> and the problem is, you are, you are the best lawyer, lawyer, usually you are very creative. And you know, the more creative you are, the more your ability to lie. Thank so, you. <laughs> I think I have done my, I have done my uh, lawyer things today. Thank you. So we'll, we're going to elevate you to the bench of the Philippine Supreme Court alongside yeah. Master Rolls. And, and we'll, we'll create some good jurisprudence there. Yeah. Um, so Harry, going back to some of the problems that uh, Ban Mang described, does that ring any bells for you? Well, <laughs> I'm a born rebel. Peter said, I don't need a PowerPoint. I will use a PowerPoint. Well, and no, no, no. <laughs> but um, you see, it's important to show the uh, specific provisions that were also argued in the court. No? And so let me begin by the first issue, which really had to be brought out and which eventually had to be decided by the Supreme Court. No? And that is, what kind or what degree of protection does the internet have? Because in the Philippines, they seem to make a distinction between print media, media and radio. No? And the jurisprudence is that when it comes to broadcast, the government is entitled to exercise more control because it's very intrusive, it's very pervasive, whereas in print media, then they will say it is entitled to full control. No? Now, fortunately for us, the U.S. Supreme Court, in the case of Reno versus ACLU, has decided on this. And the U.S. Supreme Court has said that, in fact, the internet is entitled to the highest degree of protection because, um, because it is not similar to radio. It is very um, unlikely that uh, viewers who go to an internet site will do so unwillingly because there's already a technology that will ask the user whether or not they want to proceed. No? And of course, you need an internet connection first before you can access it, unlike a radio that can be heard by anyone in a um, locality, including minors. No? So we're hoping that the um, Supreme Court will adopt the US Supreme Court um, decision 
and rule that the internet is entitled to the highest um, protection. Now, the internet is very important in the Philippines. We are the world's number one user of social media. 93.9 penetration rate for the internet. For Facebook, that's nine out of 10 people, Filipinos are on the internet. We're number six in the world for Twitter. Now yesterday I already <laughs> discussed with you some of the questions that we have for libel. Now I'm showing you just slides of what I showed in the court because the problem with arguing against the constitutionality of the cyber crimes law is that only three justices out of 15 actually use a PC to write their decisions. The 12 others write a pen and a pad paper. No? So you have to actually illustrate what it is. No? Now, um, but I think the, the other substantial points that um, we want a ruling from the court is given the definition of who will be liable. Um, will intermediaries be liable? Will the internet companies be liable? Now, this is not an idle question. Apparently, they have always intended um, some other entity to be liable other than the author. And this has to do with IP violations because the Cyber Crime Prevention Act also provides for um, violations of IP rights as being criminal. No? And because 60% of all users in the Philippines go to cyber cafes for purposes of copyright infringement, they want to hold the cyber cafe owner liable as an accessory. So it's not an idle question, it's not an academic question, it's part of the intent. Now another aspect that I was asked by the court to argue, which was a day before the oral arguments, was the constitutionality of the prohibition on cyber sex. Cyber sex was lumped together with libel as content related um, restrictions. No? And the definition of libel sex is basically willful engagement operation of lascivious exhibition of sexual organs. Now the reality was, of course, as a teacher professor of constitutional law, I know all the tests, but it boils down to the judges will determine what is obscene and unfortunately, in the absence of a definition, the, def the definition of Lord Dyson of what is lascivious will differ definitely from what Mark Stephen thinks is obscene. And of course, both their definitions will still differ from how a Dutchman will view it, and Peter will have his own definition of obscene. No? So what I did was rather than argue, so you got the point. <laughs> so rather than argue all these tests, which basically says, you know, I know what is obscene when I see one, I decided to show pictures for the first time in the court. Now, a day before, I was talking to my, my team, including Rommel, and saying we're, we're engaging in a gamble here because they could cite us in direct contempt of court because this was shown before the Philippine Supreme Court. So instead of arguing, I just said, okay, fine, let's start with the presumption that because it's content-based restriction, it's presumed unconstitutional, and let the state um, argue why it should be upheld. And then I asked the question of the court very old men. Are these slides lascivious? Now, we have a very young Chief Justice who is a born-again Christian. And as soon as, who was my immediate predecessor in the university, and I knew she would be shocked, and true enough, when I first showed this slide, she went <gasps> <laughs> But anyway, I didn't stop there, because this was a classy enough. I wanted to capture basically what was expressly prohibited by the law, which is the sexual act. So I got this uh, picture, and this is exhibited actually, the first one is from uh, MoMA, this is at the Tate. And of course, I wanted another one, which is something that is exhibited in Sydney, no? and ask the question basically, so if this is posted on the web, it doesn't have to be posted on the web, no? because the Cyber Prevention Act cover even standalone computers, computers that do not transmit. So oh, you know, if this is in fact lascivious, then I just committed the crime under the cyber prevention law, which is why we said it should be declared unconstitutional on its face because of the doctrine of overbreath. <coughs> now, the other provision is that it imposes a higher penalty compared to the libel that you find in the revised penal code. Now, of course, the significance of this is why should you be subjected to higher penalty? There's issues of equal protection of the law, no? Well, the author justified this by saying, look, the internet can reach every corner of the world. And that is why it's entitled to be punished more heavily than ordinary libel. But you see, what this does is um, by subjecting, subjecting it to a higher penalty, this will ensure imprisonment for all those convicted uh, for violating cyber libel. The reason is libel under the revised penal code being punishable only by up to six years 
can be subject to probation and parole. So you can be convicted, but you don't have to spend time in jail. And that is why the Supreme Court issued that administrative order telling judges, just impose fines. But because of this law now, if you're convicted under the cyber prevention law, you're guaranteed to spend jail time. And the minimum is six years in jail, maximum 12. Now, talk of chilling um, protected rights, no? Now this also says, there's also a provision which says that if you're already convicted for cyber libel, you can still be convicted for ordinary libel. Now obviously that's a violation of double jeopardy because as I said, there is no new crime of cyber libel. It just clarifies that the, the publication in the internet is publication, which is the element of libel. But you see this has a further significance as far as data protection is concerned. We also have a data protection law which says and adopts the, basically the EU regime on, on data protection, and that is you need the consent of the owner of the data if you are going to publish it. So technically, anyone who does not want his picture published on Facebook may be sued not only under the Data Protection Act, but also under the Cyber Prevention Act, and be subjected to a minimum of six years to 12, six years to 12 years of imprisonment. Now, this is the provision that where we beat our American compatriots from the land of the home of the free in filing suit. This is basically the case of Verizon. Now the law allows um, real-time collection of traffic data. And the government argued, you know, we're just getting data that is the same data that you find in your phone bill. So why should you, comp you complain? Um, and the government was arguing that you have no expectation of privacy as to this information on who we, you called, how long, and when. No? But take note that government is authorized to collect this data um, with no real standards on when they can do it. It only says, with due cause. Mm. And government was arguing that it's no different, really, from a police officer seeing a crime being committed. But the thing is, this is only for data, not content. So it's really similar to seeing an envelope of a letter addressed to a person. So why should there be any suspicion on the basis of the addressee of a letter when you don't know what the content is? Which means, therefore, that if you were to apply normal rules, you should not be allowed to open it. Now, this is the ultimate draconian clause that was found in the law. You know, the funny thing is all these provisions that we're objecting were not in the final version of the law, as was deliberated where we were invited to provide their inputs. That's 20% of my time in the university appearing before Congress. Everything was inserted um, during the bilateral conference between the House and the Senate. And it's because senators, some senators, were really subjected to criticism on the internet. So decided to fight back and say, we will teach these netizens a lesson. So section 19, which was not even defended by government, so either way, we have a victory, okay? says that the Secretary of Justice can actually take down any website, okay? And the only basis is if there is prima facie finding that there is a violation of the provision of this act, which really makes the Secretary of Justice the investigator, the prosecutor, and the judge. That's about it. Thank you very much, Harry, and I'm sorry I cut you short, but we are running desperately short of time. Now, we. We've, we've heard five presentations spanning three continents of, you know, on, a, on a variety of topics, on a lot of topics. I want to ask if there are any questions, and I want to encourage the students to ask some questions here as well. I mean, you really do have some terrific expertise in the room here, and you there, put your, your hand up. Can, can we get a microphone up there? Hello. Yeah, uh, in the internet is uh, the internet media. There are a lot of user-generated content with unlimited space for anonymity, and also user gen user with uh, virtual identities. There are also arguments which regard anonymity is one of the salient features of internet media. In this regard, how do you ensure the users can be made re more responsible and more ethical in their practice? Also, how do you see reliability on internet media? Well, they are they are also they are also having virtual communicators, and how do you see reliability from legal perspective when uh, also regarding the freedom of expression? Like, uh, if any state or any country that um, blocks any sites is also going to misinterpret 
uh, the uh, genuine sites and block them? Uh, how do you see this? So, so, so the last, so your first question was about user responsibility. Your, your last question was about when countries block sites. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the, some of the countries are they are blocking sites, uh, saying they are not, uh, not they are defaming something, uh, someone, or they are uh, uh, they have some um, some level of pornography or this right, kind of thing. Right. right, I see. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. What was your name? What was your country? Where are you from? I'm from Nepal. I'm Chandi Rajdal. Right. Thank you very much. Let's let's take a few more questions. Oops. Um, and then and then round them up perhaps. Um, yes, please. You say your name and where you're from as well. Gilbert, I'm from Media Defense. This is in response to Marcelo's talk on normative responsibility of intermediaries. How will you react to two, car two counter arguments to it? Or in Bambam's terminology, two lies against it. Number one, that if the interme intermediaries will be given normative responsibility, it's actually giving a logistical challenge to the point that it's almost negating freedom of expression. And they become now the state's deputized gatekeepers of truth rather than the agents of truth. Secondly, second counter argument against it is that it's actually a form of state outsourcing of a function that should be within the state's powers. And that is judicial function because intermediaries are not really trained to decide based on the law. And in essence, it might not even be subject to judicial review. OK, thank you very much. Do we have any more questions right now? Uh, hello, my name is Adam. I'm a LLM student. Um, sorry to pick on you again, Marcelo, just about the um, ISP liability, just following on from those points. Um, there's also an economic argument as well. Um, why would an ISP want to stay in a country where they are um, entirely liable for everything that is posted via them? Surely they'll just leave. And also, um, where ISPs are also multi-jurisdictional as well. So how, how would you deal with that, that aspect of it as well? OK, Marcelo, do you want to take those two questions yeah. first, and then we'll go to the rest of the panel uh, for the other one? Basically, uh, what I'm, uh, what's the current approach? You have two approaches. You have a, 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 on, an almost absolute immunity, which was the approach in the US, and then you, which is the approach in the US, and then you have the approach, uh, which was the approach in the UK, uh, of an, uh, uh, an obligation to, to take content down upon the receipt of a notification, uh, which was changed, we know, by the Defamation a a Act uh, uh, this year. Uh, what I was advocating here uh, was something between, because if you have, uh, if you uh, the, the, the European approach is also an approach for for uh, for take uh, take down auto, so you receive a notification and you need to take the, the content down automatically. In the US, the approach is you receive a notification, you basically don't don't need to do uh, uh, anything, uh, unless it involves intellectual property rights, then the, the DMCA is applicable. So on the one hand, you have an obligation of taking content down automatically upon receipt of, of a notification. On the other hand, you have an absolute immunity. Both, both uh, ways, they don't encourage any kind of reflection by an ISP. On, on, on one of the approaches, which is the US approach, you don't favor privacy, you don't favor reputation, you, fra you favor freedom of expression uh, by a matter of first principles of, over other uh, interests. Right? Uh, whereas in the European approach, uh, you have uh, uh, almost basically a, a chilling effect by default uh, embedded uh, 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 in the European uh, di uh, Electronic Commerce Directive, uh, which uh, upon the receipt of, of a notification, the, the online service provider would just take the content down. W won't reason about that content. Would they just take the content down? And that has a chilling effect on freedom of expression. How do you find a way around this? Because you, you have two extremes, right? Uh, so uh, the, the, the implication is that the online service provider will never be able to be neutral because he, he is always weighing uh, between two different uh, perspectives, between freedom of expression on the one hand uh, and, uh, uh, and reputation and privacy on the other hand. So uh, how, do you, how do you solve this problem? Uh, it's very difficult for the online service provider if, he's, uh, uh, if he has uh, an obligation towards the result. If he doesn't take the content <coughs> down, he will be automatically liable. 
right? But if the obligation is like akin to the obligation that you have in the responsible communication defense, which was what I was advocating here, you don't have the obligation of being right, right? You may even be wrong, but as, as long as you follow some, uh, some steps, you, you uh, apply some efforts uh, 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 to, to try to examine that situation that you <coughs> had before you uh, and, uh, and decide based on those, uh, uh, on those factors. Uh, you, uh, if you do that uh, 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 reasonably, right? You uh, responsibly, like journalists, like uh, 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 bloggers, yeah. right? You won't, uh, you won't uh, uh, be held liable uh, by the result. So uh, you need to find a way of weighing these different values. Uh, the online service provider will never be able to be completely neutral unless uh, he just becomes uh, a means for, uh, for receiving notification and channeling that, that notification to others, which was approach that was uh, adopted in the UK. Uh, but then you have other problems that, 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 that result from that, a problem of timing, of jurisdiction, which is a problem that the UK is trying uh, uh, to, uh, to address right now. Because uh, if, if you just move things back uh, to the state and, and the online intermediary doesn't have any normative rule, right, that, become, uh, that also becomes a problem. And in my presentation, what I was arguing is that there is a normative rule that they should perform, but it's a norm normative rule which is limited. Uh, which is okay. not that they should be... Uh, Barcelo, I'm, I'm going to have to... I, I mean, I think you posed the, the two com conflicting yep, yep. interests. I mean, you, you, yeah, you paint them very well. I do, every time you say responsible, bam, bam, goes like this next to you. Um, I, I, I want to bring in the rest of the panel. And I know Mark, he threw his hat into the uh, ring first. I want to give him the floor first. And then I've been told that we have to um, stop sort of now. <laughs> so, so we're going to have sort of a, a round of final comments from the panel. I'm really sorry about that. I know lots of interesting issues were raised, but you can continue them over lunch. So it's a Mark first, and then Charles, Harry, Bamba. Okay, I, I just wanted to be uh, very quick on this. Um, I think uh, going to this question of the uh, role of the intermediary, I would take first of all those. Uh, sites which are effectively scandalous. Uh, if you're an intermediary, you know that this site is carrying scandalous material and therefore defamatory material and therefore you're on notice. Uh, and that seems to me to follow from the old decisions uh, relating to distributors. But it's got to be at a pretty extreme end of the scale. But for the for overwhelming majority, I'm not convinced of, by Marcella's <coughs> argument that you can uh, do anything uh, if you're an intermediary. You're not in a position to know, and you are just channeling. And ultimately, what happens is that if you're put on notice, effectively, all that happens is you either tell people um, or it comes down. You don't, you're not in a position to actually engage in any meaningful way. And so that ultimately is going to lead to an arbitraging between different jurisdictions. We see a lot of people already moving uh, their servers to the US to take benefit of Section 230. And so as a result of that, I think that really is uh, going to be an issue uh, going forward. And, and going to your question about uh, anonymity, uh, I think that there is something about uh, uh, anonymity and virtual uh, identities. But of course, the reality is that nobody is actually anonymous. We know that the indelible marks are left, and if you get the appropriate court orders, you can find out who these people are. And I, I sort of believe in the innate good sense of crowds. If you've got a whole range and diversity of opinions, you should go with most reasonable people will make up their minds when they read the comments on what is reasonable. They will not go to the extreme. So ultimately, I'm uh, prepared to leave it much more loosely than I think Marcelo would. Right, Charles? Yes, I also want to respond to uh, the, uh, the student from Nepal, your question about anonymity and so on. Uh, to me, uh, you mentioned also the word responsibility, which uh, we understand from Indonesia what it means. I think in China, we have the same word, which is, ha which is harmony. Uh, so uh, so the, my question is, why do you assume that most of the things are bad anyway? Uh, and uh, I've used, uh, I always like to do this. I claim my, uh, how long I've been using the internet. I've used the internet si uh, since 1982, and uh, more than 30 years. And for internet old timers and purists like myself, we look at anonymity as a core value of the internet. 
And uh, you've seen some, uh, and particularly because in cases where people need to tell the truth and whistle blowing and so on, if you have uh, a real name system, which some, some countries, including China, is trying to put in, uh, you're just going to blow that uh, totally away. And for some of the countries that have tried this um, real name system, in particular Korea, because they had a lot of uh, cyberbullying and so on, so they put in an a, a, a online or to the online games uh, community companies, they put in a real name system. And you know what happened after a couple of years? All the data were lost. All the ID numbers and the names and the, and so on of the of the citizens that played online games were lost and they are stolen by people in China, in the Hong Kong, or all over the world uh, trying to get in to play the computer games. And then these, and then, so imagine the security and, pr and privacy uh, 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 implication. The more data you save, the more risky uh, risk you're taking. And uh, particularly in today's world when people are beginning to be so concerned about surveillance by governments and so on, or other people, uh, you know, this is, I think, just going to make things worse, uh, so in my mind. Uh, Thank you the other thing is that you also mentioned about site you, blocking. You've got one, well, yeah. one second. Yeah. The, 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 <laughs> the last thing, uh, site blocking that you mentioned, to me, is just a form of censorship. And uh, I don't want to put any more power into the hands of government. Harry? Yeah. More well, power to government? <coughs> what do you say? Me? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, that question was asked by the Chief Justice in the Philippines. No? In fact, she even discussed the question in the context of a teenager who was forced to commit suicide because of cyberbullying. And in the end, you know, my response was, number one, as far as def defamation is concerned, there's always an alternative, which is civil defamation. And number two, really, the whole thing, this internet, is really the, a technological version of the free marketplace of ideas. No? So there will be unfortunate instances, but because of the free marketplace of ideas, we know what the truth is. And of course, let me answer your question by just restating the principle behind the free marketplace of ideas. No? It is always, the only true test still for the truth is for the power of an idea to be accepted as truth in the free marketplace of ideas. Thank you. Bam Bam, can you close this off and lead us into lunch? Well, uh, I, if I have to choose between full immunity and full responsibility, of course, you know, I'm traumatized by responsibility. I could choose full immunity anytime. But in Indonesia, at one time in the press council of Indonesia, I was threatened to put the Minister of Information in jail because he was trying to put a ministerial decree to say, to control the uh, internet, which we think is, might uh, hurt the freedom of the press. And fortunately for Indonesia, our uh, press law give the power to put in jail anyone who can be found guilty of, of, of infringement of freedom of the press up to two years. So I said to the minister, look, if you sign this regulation, the moment you sign it, I'll go to the police station and report you for, to go to jail. So he didn't. But, uh, <laughs> but then I w we went back and we thought, I, we call up all the you know, the, the, the uh, me online media, I mean, seem to have a, a meeting and after uh, eight uh, long meetings in almost a year, finally they all agreed to have some sort of rule, self-rule about how to deal with this. And our rule is basically just like the U US rule, which is, you know, it, it's, it's just like this. If you have a white fence in your house and someone wrote a nasty thing on it about somebody else, Who's responsible? And and to, 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 uh, to us, we come up to, you are only responsible after you know about it for a reasonable time or you didn't do anything about it. Then you are partly re responsible. Otherwise, you don't even know it is. How can you be responsible? So then we, uh, we come up with an agreement. Okay, and uh, if, if nobody report it, then you don't know, especially if your website has millions of, of users, uh, then uh, how can you be uh, responsible. So then they say, okay, but you have to have what we call a cyber patrol, reasonable cyber. And if you have a notification within t two days, you should do something about it. If you don't do within two days, then you are actually taking full responsibility of it. Okay. Thank, you. thank you very much. I said lunch, I meant national unity and harmony, right? Because we're going to be talking about China and the internet. No lunch, stay here. Doreen, thank you. Thank you to the panel.